All right. Welcome back to The Blast with Dr. Dan putting the world on blast. Like, uh, I don't know, we're having a blast. It seemed like it had that dual, you know, so we're going to roll with it. Uh, essentially, I have comedians on here. Sometimes it's two comedians, sometimes it's one comedian. And we roll through the news and politics unabashedly about politics and things that maybe you don't care about. But I don't know. We do. So this week, uh, it's it's Robert Burrill. Burrill? Yep. Burrill again. Nailed just it. Just told me he's French. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think originally the pronunciation was Burry, because uh, you don't pronounce the L without the E at the end of it. But yeah, so I'm uh, French by nature. Yep. French by nature. And, and, and genetically, I suppose, too, but also by nature. Well, my daughter's in Bordeaux. My last name's French. My daughter was born on Bastille Day. So in theory, I've oh. got connections. You're probably just chomping at the bit for that Joaquin Phoenix Napoleon movie, huh? That's, you know, that'll be our St. Back, Patrick's Day. Yep. <laughs> a while back, I deep dove on Napoleon because I got so interested in it. I was turning it into kind of stuff for a one person show. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So much going on with that guy. I'm definitely, I have a little bit of catch up because I saw Oppenheimer and I, I got the book. So that's going to be probably the next two months for me is like doing the deep dive on Oppenheimer. But then, because Napoleon, you never really hear about him. It's all Hitler. It's all Stalin, Mao, maybe. They kind of just clog up the dictator lane or the emperor lane where you're like, oh yeah, let me uh, check in on that little fella that made some waves in the 1800s. It's fascinating. Like when you, when you actually go in and do the research on that guy, like he wasn't um, exactly a you know a hated dictator. You know, no, he, uh, no, he took over from you know in between kind of the um, French Revolution. You know, once they killed off the aristocracy, they tried to get a republic going, and he was kind of in the way. And mm -hmm. sort of they kind of went back and forth a long time. And then his son, no, his, I guess his grandson Napoleon the Third was the last one to grab a little bit of emperor power. Okay. And, and yeah, he wasn't even French. Oh, really? See, I don't, I've only just yeah, like the, the obvious stuff that's probably not even true yet because I haven't done the dive. But uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. All right. And so Josephine, right? He had, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. No, I was just going to say, like, I'm, I'm aware of Josephine and Waterloo and Elba and just like the extreme cliff notes. And the fact that he wasn't really all that short, it was just like the British shitting on him. And then that kind of took hold. But Right, and they're political yeah. cartoons, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at the power of comedy. We redefined it, redefined a dictator for all time. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we just made him short and angry. Yeah, like imagine uh, 200 years down the line if it's just, uh, and there would be some cosmic justice to it, but if like the only depiction or version of Hitler that people saw was Mel Brooks's Springtime for Hitler, this flamboyant, effete, uh guy yeah we can suck we can suck dictators over into comedy i had this bit about uh comedy is always more powerful than drama and tragedy i don't care what you've got or chaos or crisis or war like think of hitler at the nuremberg uh, rallies doing you know this big you know emotional rally for all his nazis everybody's cheering and then he gets off the stage and he drives away on a a segue. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely loses all the gravitas. Yeah. Comedy yeah. win. That was, yeah, that, that was Mel Brooks' whole thing with even doing it, is getting them to laugh at him. Because, yeah, if you do the serious thing, then if anything, it almost venerates him even more. It almost dips in a Riefenstahl territory where it's like triumph of the will. And then you have stuff that's like going on with, with Putin and Russia, where Republicans can't suck up to the guy enough. And it was like, weren't you the anti-Russian? Like, is this what you want? Biden tries to forgive student loans and you call him a dictator or, yes. you know, emperor. And then you have like the actual dictator. You're like, man, if only we could have a leader like him. I'm like, oh, is that what it would take if Putin forgives Russian students debt? That's the, the like, OK, you know what? Let's fund Ukraine now. This guy's just handing out education that we won't we can't stand for that. Give give Zelensky some more. Uh, some more drones. Yeah, and I always, again, I mix my worlds together, and I probably shouldn't do as much as I do, but the comedy world and the rhetoric world, that's essentially because everybody that's conservative is really a story rhetorician. 
Like they just believe mm. the stories. They don't care about the facts or the logic or the contradictions within it. Yeah. But they care about is the story character and the strong mm. man character, whether it's an illusion or not, they love that strong daddy, you know, iron fist <laughs> cleaning up the family character. And they don't care who plays it. Yeah, because there's no there's no room for nuance there. It's sort of like the people's history of the United States versus just like the great man theory. Because it, it makes our job easier where it's like, well, I'm never going to be Lincoln. And like, well, it wasn't just Lincoln or like it wasn't just Martin Luther King Jr. But in perpetuating that, then if anything, it discourages mass movements and stuff because it's like, no, no, it's great men. We're, we're not great men. We might be OK. We don't beat our wives. We don't whatever. We're not. We're OK. We're not great. And then it's. And then when you look back, it's, you just remember the Obama. You don't remember everybody that voted for him. You remember FDR, not like how terrible situa the situation was and everything. And certainly they were skilled, but the idea of like, it just goes from great man to great man to great man is such an oversimplification that they can. Right. Then... But again, like when you, when you add logic to it and you take the yeah. story apart, mm -hmm. and you're like, yeah. oh, over, you know, there's all this, nobody wants to hear that explanation. It's yeah. like, yeah. And, and you hit it right on the head. Like, you know, Maverick was the biggest movie of the year. Barbie is even great woman. You know, mm -hmm. it's one great figure fits in a story. It doesn't fit with, oh, they're, you know, yeah. even like the crowd in Marvel, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen Oppenheimer, but was he great man or conflicted man who finally did something great? He, I mean... He, he, he definitely thought, well, I think he kind of got off on the confliction and they sort of addressed that in the movie. I really liked it because you get the sense that even he really didn't know what he wanted. Like he wanted to be in charge and he wanted it to work. And I don't think the ramifications of it even occurred to him because he was so focused on, I want to be the bomb guy. I want, you know, I think it was important that the test worked for him. And then later on, after the government used it, because, of course, it was going to use it, he kind of wanted it both ways. And they, the movie does a good job of kind of calling him a task for it, too, where he was like, well, I learned that if, you know, the government's going to use any weapon you give it for the most part, like, you didn't factor that in at all. You didn't no. think. Because in his justification, it was like, well, we can't let the Nazis get it first. We can't let the Nazis get it first. And then by the time the Nazis weren't even in it, by the time we used it. So even that justification fell flat. But then I think he also sort of wanted to be the guy with the blood on his hands and the, what have I done? But he wanted it both ways. He wanted to be the bomb guy. And then when it was used, he wanted to be the, oh, but why did we have to use the bomb guy? And it was like, well, you know. Right. Well, and then again, like if you look at the evolution of storytelling, if you can just keep people in the frame of story and be mm -hmm. like, well, evolution of storytelling now, like you can't have an unconflicted hero. Like it's yeah. just too simple for most of the modern audience. Like you have to see some, you know, some complication within the character and they, they drag it all the way up to where it's almost all complication, yeah. you know, and then a little bit of saving grace. And we seem to be fine with that, like the breaking bats and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, but like in the real world, and that's kind of what's happened with Trump. He's almost all complication, but he yeah. mouths a few things that are kind of saving grace, national, nationalist, recognizable, great man or like story he, character. He won't touch the safety net, Medicare, Medicaid. And they're like, oh, okay, well, so then it's like, all right, well, I mean, the shift from the Republican Party from Reagan to Trump is since it's become that cult of personality and now policies, who needs a policy? Right. And then you look at some yeah. of that stuff where like they were completely free trade, uh, neoliberal foreign yeah, but policy. Again, you're logicking, you're, you're rational. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I always tell but people that's what I... in my, in my course about like how to convert a conservative, I'm like, just mm -hmm. stop talking logic. I don't want to hear any logic coming out of your mouth because yeah. you're going to lose, but I want to hear story. Like the mm -hmm. Jesus story is a great man's story. You know, he had a little bit of complicated because his dad was involved too. You know, so he didn't get yeah. the full cred. Yeah. But it's the same <laughs> story. Yeah. You know, and if you want to compete with a great man story, well, then go in and, you know, pull out the rug underneath the great manness, which yeah. is what they keep trying with Trump, but they're doing it the wrong way. Like, you know, if he, if he was if he was something that was clearly a villain to the right, like if he was mm -hmm. gay, if he yeah, was yeah. trans, like any of those things, if he was a different color, 
Yeah. You know, any of that kind of stuff, you can complicate him, but it's really hard to do when he's just the big white man with a big mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And and like we talked about last time, I think, too, when you mentioned like the the mythos thing where it's like he's already done such a great job of casting himself as fighter, warrior, savior, that for those people that you can't reach with facts and logic and reason, there's no... And the fact that Republicans are still like, well, he's he's indicted four times now. He's going to fuck like the Nikki Haley's, the Tim Scott's like they're either completely delusional or they're playing for vice president uh, in this, you know, the, the future. Let's hang this person, uh, you know, and so it's no one's challenging him. I, I am looking forward to the debate because I do think that if he does debate, well, either even if he doesn't debate, Chris Christie's going to go up there. Yeah, Christie's we'll come, been, yeah. Christie's going to go hard at him. And then he puts everybody else in the position of having to defend him. And then it's like, well, why are you even running? Because all you're doing up there is is defending the guy from Chris Christie. So why? Yeah, if you can get somebody in to do slander on Trump mm-hmm. in prime time, yeah. you might get a little story traction. Yeah, you know? I think but if anyone, I, and I doubt he's got a chance, but at least Christie's like the only one in that lane of... And he's he's got he's he's built a nice little narrative for himself too. I came out and supported him right away. I worked on the the transition team for him from Obama. I clashed with the Kushners. January sixth happened. I realized he wasn't. So now I've learned my lesson, and yeah. I still have the conservative principles. Fool me once, Trump, but you're not going to fool me again. And I'm not saying that people buy it necessarily, but you do see that like okay. You need like an arc, a story versus just, you know, policies, the, the policy differential, which no one cares about. Right. Now, Christie's playing the story narrative of the contrite center, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the saved center, which plays really well with that audience. If you can get in there, if you can wedge yourself in enough. And, you know, again, you've got to turn Trump somehow from the superhero into some kind of middling, you know, person in the middle. And that that wedge might work. I mean, Pence is trying the same strategy about, yeah. you know, the safe center. Yes, I believed and we did a lot of good work, but then he went too far and I had to, you know, slightly balk. Um, I had to use, I, well, actually it was funny because like, it wasn't even like he had to use power. There, there was no power. Like you didn't have the power. So his big act of rebellion was not using power he didn't have to stop an election that he couldn't. <laughs> Yeah, but they've learned that, again, sort of the mob boss tactics, like if you can get it into the courts, yeah, then power shifts everywhere. Like the, the differential power is completely different inside the courts. So if you can get it into the court, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and start playing court games with it, then you gain new power. Mm-hmm. And that's what our, that was really the whole argument. It's like, hey, Trump or Pence, just send it back to the states and watch everything become a shit show. And then yeah, we're going to yeah. go into the courts and we'll, we're pretty good at, you know, dodging and you know, shaping the courts. And it seems like the Georgia indictments, because it's the RICO stuff, so that's exactly the kind of thing they're talking about, is the the whole strategy, basically, of getting, you know, and then who was involved and in getting it by the, the slate of electors and and that whole thing and how, I guess, Trump's defense is just like, well, the lawyers were, t-. it's like, yeah, the lawyer that told you what you wanted to hear after the other yeah. 25 quit. Well, the nice thing about the RICO is that that has developed within the court system over 50, 75 years of dealing with the mob. They know Mm -hmm. how to deal with all those tactics. Yeah. Right. They know everything that's coming. They know every piece of argument, every piece of delay. And so he's in a new ball game right now where he can't control that court. And it isn't even like smart. Like they have them dead to rights. Like, hey, just find me uh, 11,000 votes. Wink, wink. Which is also funny that He's a narcissist, but at the same time, only wanted one more vote. Right, right. And Biden, a, a comic buddy of mine posted a, a tweet about that, too. His name is Derek Hankles. I want to give him credit. But that didn't even occur to me. And that's one of those things where I'm like, oh, how did I miss that? But it's just so funny that, like, I don't want to blow Biden out of the water. Just one vote, a gentleman's, you know, I don't want to make him look bad. Let's just get one more. Let's just get, find one more vote than what I need to to be the winner. Sure. So I, I saw uh, something on your um, feed where somebody was praising you or had written you up as one of the promising new political comedians on the scene. So talk about that a little bit. Are you out in the clubs doing 
politics? Are you doing social I, issue stuff? What are you doing? I, yeah, I mean, so yeah, both. I think politics. I mean, it's not soapboxy. It's not going up there. I I open with a, a pretty good chunk on Biden. Um, I, I mentioned the cocaine at the White House. I mentioned RFK Jr. and and so I start by prodding the left a little bit, and then from there, I just I kind of go back and forth, and I don't do anything too overt. But then um, it's structured in a way where I don't think I'm hammering one side for too long without going back to the other side, because then I I mentioned the right trying to attack Biden for being woke. And that kind of gets me into this LGBTQ AI bit. But then I, I focus on the fact that A stands for asexual. And then it's like, well, what are we even doing here? Like, that's the sexual identity group. Like, what's so then I kind of make fun of that, not in a way that's. I, I, that I feel like is punching down or anything, but just the inherent nature of asexuals within a sexual identity group. And so I feel like everyone laughs at that, but the right can really sort of enjoy that. And then I feel like I built up enough goodwill with the Biden and the asexual stuff. Then I kind of pivot more to making fun of the laws that are going on in Florida, the don't say gay bill, the banning the books. And I find an angle on that where it's just like, we can all agree this is pretty ridiculous. But then it's, I feel like the left, and even the right a little bit, because not all Republicans are for that stuff. They're they're fiscally conservative, they're isolationist, they're whatever. So it's a matter of just kind of cherry picking particular issues and putting a little bit of a spin on it where I can get most people on board with me and then riding that out for a while before doing it again on the other side. So it is politics, but I don't I don't think I'm I'm being soapboxy about it. I'm not saying... I'm right, you're wrong. I'm saying, I think we can all agree this is wrong. And it seems to be working pretty well. Yeah, so you're finding techniques that let you do that material without instantly triggering, you know, the the triggerables out there. Like I've yeah. done that before with, one of the things I do when I do political stuff is, again, sort of going back and forth on both sides, but it's like hypotheticals, right? So- you say like this and this and this is fine, right? So like, you, who mm -hmm. wants to build a wall? Okay. Yeah. And people, some people still, yeah, I want to build. A wall. Okay, great. How how high is the wall? Like yeah. hundred is a hundred feet okay? Mm -hmm. Like a capital wall with? Can we put armed guards on the wall to, to pick people off if they're trying to get over the wall? Like are you like what yeah. are you okay with? And they and yeah. to get them to think within the broader context of the, the idea of what is mm -hmm. a barrier and what's acceptable. Like, can we electrify the wall? Yeah. You know, do you want to, and can we take videos of that? So it gets triggered and you see <laughs> a, family, a Guatemalan family, you know, fry. Is that yeah. cool? That <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would you watch that feed? We'd probably watch that mm -hmm. feed. Yeah. Is, that, is that which yeah, one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that hypotheticalness gets people to broaden it into a meta issue instead of a, you know, lockdown. I've only thought about it in this narrow bandwidth issue, which is yeah. what comedy is great at. Take them out of that bandwidth a little bit and they don't know how to locate themselves for a mm -hmm. little while so you can do some cool work. Yeah, or just kind of like trying to, Ben Washburn had a good uh, uh, line about it. I think he just said in conversation or something about like trying to, do political or topical stuff and and bring people from the other side or like factor in their opinions where it's like we need to respect each other's fears right like i get you know if, if you're on the right you you fear crime you fear all this you know, job displacement all this other kind of stuff where it's like you have to acknowledge that and so when you're doing jokes uh, about it i think you need to kind of be respectful for some of the concerns that the other side has and that's why, at least when I do it, I try to pick particular issues, whether it's the Michelangelo's David statue being considered pornographic or some other stuff where it's like, OK, like maybe maybe I am targeting probably religious conservatives that would see something like that as pornographic. But at a comedy club, at a bar, even if it's in Wisconsin or Iowa, like some red state, like if you're an adult at a bar drinking you're probably okay with some pornography jokes, some like anti-religious stuff. Cause I'm not doing the material in church. Then I would imagine it would go quite poorly. Although that would be a fun idea for a special is me just bombing in a church for an hour. Um, 
but and maybe yeah. not call it bombing in a church maybe no probably not no that's <laughs> historically that would uh that might trigger some people and rightfully so but i'd find a sacrifice maybe a, some sort of sacrifice angle right. for it. jesus yeah, isn't yeah. the only one who died up here i was about to say yeah or dying <laughs> for your sins and then <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you a topic off the uh, news, and let's see what we can come up with in the moment. You saw this, but uh, there's a German supermarket giant called, uh, what is it called, 80, uh, Aldi's brand. Oh, they yes. Just, they just bought 400 Winn-Dixies in the South. So the Germans are taking over the Southern supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, 100 years late, but they finally, you know, yep. got in and took out the American supply chain. Are there any uh, Polish supermarkets that should be on watch right now? Or are there any, uh, or probably in Chicago, some uh, sausage places that need to be uh, at red alert? Yeah, how are we going to stop this? Like once they, you know, they've taken Winn-Dixie, what's next? I was, I was about to say, yeah, I'm French. Like this is not boding well for any uh, uh, cafes or something in the, not that there's a lot in the middle of the country, but yeah, I mean, it definitely it's I feel like Germany, they they're, they're ready to make their move now. They've been laying low for a while. They they next the, the up through capitalism. They're coming up through the exactly guts of capitalism yep. this time to tentacle their way into the body of America. Yeah, well, that is kind of what they did uh, economically right over in Europe with the EU as they kind of became the economic powerhouse. And then instead of like, I mean, this isn't funny, this isn't a bit, but like it's sort of just like how they recalibrated from like, well, we don't need to militarily take over. We can just because they have such an industrial base, we can just decide what strings we want to attach to all the money we give out. And then the countries have to play ball with us if they want bailouts, if they want. Well, that's that's whatever. America. America did the yeah. same thing, mm -hmm. right? That's, yeah, yeah. That's how we you know, gotten bases everywhere. It's how we've gotten our mm -hmm. culture everywhere is is through financial imperialism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, you know, you can't fault Germany for that. Yeah. Do a bit about that financial imperialism. <laughs> you, know, you know, if you have to, you know, if you're going to be imperialistic, I think you want the economic imperialism, right? That's. It's a softer, yeah, it's exactly. a softer takeover. Yeah, for sure. But the German and Winn-Dixie, that fits in there perfectly of uh, financial imperialism coming back around. Like it just, like it just, mm -hmm. they're going to, they're going to, they've circled us. They've snuck around the back and they've finally found the, uh, the open door, you know, into the system. I, I didn't, I had no idea Aldi was German. I didn't know whoever, whoever is in charge of branding and marketing at Aldi, I think has done a pretty good job of fending off the the German <laughs> ties or the German, like I just imagine a board meeting where it's like, you, you know, uh, they're working on slogans or something. And, uh, you know, and, and instead of Black Friday, it's like, oh, Blitzkrieg Friday. Like, no, we're not calling it that. That's not, stop it, stop it, guys. That's. Well, Kroger sounds German. I'm looking it up right Kroger now. For Kroger for sure does. Yeah, that definitely. Like, is that's it Jewish sounds... German or is it just straight up? That sounds Kruger. like the name of a, a, that could have been a general at a camp. Kruger, Kroger, that's definitely. Yeah, it's a variant of Kruger, uh, Bernard Kroger in 1860. Created it. Interesting. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. See, they've gotten our food. Mm-hmm. What's next? <laughs> Fashion? Fashion, a lot of brown suits. Are they? Uh... I can't see the Germans ever taking over fashion. Maybe I guess like <laughs> a, you know the Matrix was kind of the German look coming back in. Yeah, that's true. A lot of I don't even know what what is the German fashion. Is it uh, a lot of blacks? A lot of a lot of leather. A lot of black leather. leather. Okay, Neo, well leather. You can make a comeback punk. with leather. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Nazism's made a comeback in the country. I feel like German fashion is more like a, that's probably safe if if Nazism can come back. Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty good, right? So, what are the products going to be at the new German Southern? <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay, well, let's see. Um, Some kind of corn dog with you can bludgeon somebody with a corn dog. Is that what it is? <laughs> bludgeon sized corn dogs, man. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um, I don't know. Probably, let's see. Um, formerly Polish sausage. 
uh, formerly <laughs> Polish sausages. Uh, we have to get rid of sauerkraut. We don't want to hear that word kraut in our. Yeah. Uh, Occupied French fries, maybe. Uh, there you go. Yeah, there's probably a, a few few hallmarks of the new German uh, <laughs> cuisine. Lo, you know, a lot of beer, probably. I think that be, might be the way to America's hearts, as if it was the the beer stuff. The um, Guinness isn't German. What's Guinness is Irish, right? Guinness is, is Irish. Bud Budweiser. Big, Budweiser, yeah. Mm -hmm. Budweiser. Although we, we got, you know, we got ahead of that though with the whole trans thing. Now there's no way Germany wants to touch, like, open the open the Budweiser Avenue into their uh, economic Did it leak imperialism over to that Budweiser way. Or was it just Bud Light like that just took the, the cultural hit? I don't know. That's a good question. Because like, the obviously- Budweiser's still manly, but, right? I think it's still pure. Yeah. <laughs> I did do a bit about how Bud Light sounds like how bros would refer to their friend that is transitioning into a woman. Like, this is my Bud <laughs> Light, not full Bud. She's- okay not cool with everything so not like uh but yeah there i wonder i wonder how much but if it's just the book because i know i did um the funny bone in st louis and up before that Bud light was our number one seller and now it's like we can't it's so dumb he's like we we can't even <laughs> right? give it no. away like it's not like your dick's gonna fall off or anything like who but that's just how tribal it's Kid Rock does one video where he cries and tries to shoot at it. And then it's like, well, I can't, you know, I yeah, got to stick with my know. team. Gayer, gayer with every sip. You know, yeah. it's like, well, and that's what I was saying. Like the story stuff, again, it's, it's not logic. It's just staying it with some type of pre-villainized symbol. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it'll come down. Like it'll fall. Like Jericho's walls will come down if you spray paint rainbows on them. Yeah, you know, like those symbols are so strong. The words are so strong. Those villainy words are so strong for the right. If you can just attach one tightly to something, it's like putting a you know bomb, a plastic explosive on the side. It will bring it down. Which is why I was saying, like with Trump, I said this way back with George Bush, like when Kerry was running against Bush, I was like, yeah, uh, was it? Yeah, it was Kerry, right? Uh, yeah. Just just make a poster with George Bush's face on it, and underneath just the word gay <laughs> mm -hmm. and you win yeah yeah because they're not looking at the logic of it they're looking at the yeah. just big feeling you know stamp of it i can't imagine though like that to me that seems like the problem with the the bud light dilemma is it can only go the one way where if conservatives or whatever those insecure guys see you drinking bud light they're like oh you support trans rights but I can't, especially on the left where it's, it just seems like it's craft beers and stuff where it's almost like, hey, in solidarity, you want to drink the butt? Like, no, I'm not drinking the butt. I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> but like, I doubt there were a lot of people that suddenly took up Bud Light as uh, the, you know, the protest drink or like maybe tried it and were like, no, nah, I'm going to go back to my yeah, it's not crazy IPA. The, yeah, it's yeah. not crappy enough for the... Um you know, the Bohemians, like it's got to go down all the way to PBR or something like that for them to sort of yeah. dip down into the lower cultures products. Mm -hmm. Bud Light is clearly middle-class product, so. Yeah, well, yeah, be interesting if it was PBR. I feel like PBR, def they might have even gotten stronger with that based on their base, but yeah, Bud, mm -hmm. I mean, more power to them for trying it, but with, with your base like that, it definitely seems like you're playing with fire a little bit. Yeah, the question becomes like who who made that decision and did not see this coming like at Bud Light? Like what was the yeah. marketing team or the executive team that was like, I mean, if you did it purposely, you're shooting, you know, a shot across the bow of the right and you're at some kind of marketing structure underneath it to capitalize on that energy. Like you Especially, had, like you, you kind of owned a, an anti Bud Light beer, you know, or yeah. But this just seemed like bad calculation to throw that kind of social. Especially here. where like you're clearly not appealing to the other side anyway. Like they would agree with it, but your product isn't suddenly be going to become appealing to them. So it's yeah. It. I mean, they could have had OJ Simpson as a spokesperson and probably <laughs> would have gone better. <laughs> you know, kill that thirst. <laughs> Stab that Kepler thirst! Really... Stab that thirst in the waiter. It's been seeing for a while. Uh, See, I would, I would respect that level of capitalism uh, appropriating social capital. 
you know, mm-hmm. of, uh, yeah, just pull the villains up. Like, he was there once in a while. They did with, um, what's his name, Reggie Bush, who got the Heisman taken away from him at USC because he was paid to play. Oh, and okay. mm-hmm. who was a Burger King or somebody had him on? It's like, we'll never take away your quarter, quarter, you know, carcinogenic burger, Reggie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that was a villainy. Like, that is a sports villainy. And for a while, that was real. Like, people really were upset about what he did. Which is, but they just went back in, like, now nah, we're going to make fun of it now. Yeah. Especially, I mean, as far as NFL scandals go, like being paid compared to, uh, who is it that like punched his girlfriend in the elevator, Ray Rice or oh, something? Ray Rice. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or like Ray Lewis, like, killed a guy. Like, oh, oh, he oh, he made a little money before he probably should have. Like, oh, woe is me. Yeah. I mean, that's almost the yeah. that's almost the sweet spot for an athlete a little bit is like you get you get that controversial, you get the controversy, you get a little bit of an edge, but at the end of the day, it's not it's not bad compared to all of the other scandals within the the league. All right, I'm just grabbing a, a my fir- the first Fox story that I see. You ready? Is this about Bud Light? No, this is just okay. random on their site right now. So, um, actress apologizes for taking relationship with married man public. Do you know this story? I, I do not, no. Uh, I don't know if you are a social media guy, but she posted, this was a woman, uh, Taryn, Taryn Manning, who, she was on Orange is the New Black. She's been okay. a kind of a side character fairly fairly prominent but she posted i watched it today because my buddy jason galern here uh who's you talk about dark and like will go into anything what a great writer and comic he is but he had posted about it on his his social and so i went and looked at it and it's her she recorded a three-minute video on instagram where she's clearly drugged up in some ones in some way or another because she's slurry and in her car you know driving and at one point she's like i had to pull over because i I didn't want to cause a major collision but she starts it with i'm i'm going down to newport to buy a boat for this married guy that i've been seeing and i licked his ass three nights in a row and now his wife has found out okay and she went into the whole why she licked his ass and what it was all about and now she now she wants to buy him a boat, but his wife is back in the picture and it's complicating things. That's is is the is the 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 married guy an actor or she's the actress and she's, she's the actress. Okay, weird. Oh well, content, you know, I'm sure it's got views. That's definitely but she she apologized. She's buying him a boat for what? She's buying him a boat. She's buying him a boat. And she apologized today for posting this for, you know, not for anything else, but for she shouldn't have posted this. She made a bad choice. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I think you were you know making a compromised cognitive, cognitive choice at that moment. But it was just the, the crazy kind of matter of factness about the random things that she's throwing into this. Well, I'm sure the the last thing that the the Mary guy thought was this public person would just throw all this out there on Instagram. Does it say what this like? Is this just just a regular Joe with a family that like <laughs> now it's like, hey, the gal from Orange is the New Black was licking your ass like that's a lot yeah. going on in these stories these days. So Orange many. is the New Brown apparently. Yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of twists and turns to this story. Yeah, you have to look at that video after we get off. It's uh, it's it's pretty funny. It's pretty intense. That's man. Did she so? Did they find out who it is, or did she leave it anonymous? And now people are like, "Who's this mystery ass that she's been licking?" <laughs> the mystery ass. I, I don't know. I don't. I didn't dive. I didn't dive deep. You know, I didn't go deep into the story. That's her style. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know if she revealed his uh, identity or not, um, but yeah, everybody in the world should watch that video because it will teach you about the collision of public and private. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this new world that's grown up, this sort of uh, pravlik or, or pravit, you know, where yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it's mm-hmm. completely 
public, but it's also completely private. And that's never really existed before. And when you see people just stomp on it so badly right there, it's just fascinating to watch. Is uh is Hunter Biden married right now? Is he a married guy? Because I like feel it. like that might, yeah, probably not. I was gonna say because if it's Fox News, Biden. I'm sure that like that's the next story. Is it was like no, he's he used to be married, and it's Hunter Biden. <laughs> Hunter oh. Biden. All right, yeah. That would be a great collision. You know, that was the whole formula for writing for Letterman was to just take two stories that you would never yeah, put yeah. together at the mm -hmm. last second, mash them up. He loved that structure. I mean, it's, it's, he's Hunter. I mean, he's obviously going through a lot of stuff, but he's, it's, it's Hunter, funny because he's founder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, cause like, he's almost like that, the Trump on the left where it almost doesn't matter what you could say about him. Cause like on the left, it's like, whatever, it's a family issue. I don't think they're blaming Biden for anything like that. And independents don't really care. And conservatives just love going at it, but it's also like, I mean, he's, it, it's nice to kind of have that person on the left that you can just joke about like that. And and Biden, there's a little bit, but he's also older. And then it's like, okay, well, is it really right to be making fun of some of this stuff? But with Hunter, it it is kind of refreshing that there is that target on there where you can joke about him and ultimately he's he's probably going to be fine so it's uh well, he's the I, billy carter he's he's the billy yeah, carter mm -hmm. yeah yeah or There's like always the, somebody in the in, somebody in the sphere that you know you can pull up and they're close the, enough to or maybe even ted kent like he doesn't have an office but like the ted kennedy basically where there's a lot of tragedy in the family and for whatever reason this guy's the one that's untouched by it and you know seems to be thriving and maybe doesn't make the best choices and stuff but you've you have more uh seems like you know nobler members of the family that uh aren't making it to <laughs> to a long life and teddy and hunter are, are uh persevering well i i suggest everybody go and watch that video uh, it's it's worth it it is culturally significant that video well we'll know who <laughs> We'll know who the guy is when the uh, boat shows up at his house. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a wife who's like, was it you? You're always asking me to lick your ass. He's like, no, damn it. It's not. Oh, you think the orange is the new black lady? Would I, like she'd be interested in me at all, let alone. And then the boat pulls up and she's like, get out of this house. You're like, well, I'll be living. <laughs> well, in maybe the boat. he's like super boat guy. And he's like, it's not my ass. It's my aft. Use <laughs> the right terminology if you're going to. Well, if she does kick him out, now he can live in the boat, which is, you know, so all right. That's yeah. All right. Let's Listen, just boat. just tow this to the marina. I gotta live in here for a while. All right, here's another one I saw that I thought was pretty funny. Uh, I'm just gonna read the headline to you. This is from CNN. It's one of their kind of side, you know, sort of life interest stories that they pull out of Florida usually. Oh, 61 year old Florida man arrested. Okay. Standard. Yeah, wouldn't even after, need to see the Florida part. Yep, right. After posing, sure. Okay. That's, again, you can see this happening as a veterinarian and operating on a pregnant Chihuahua that later died. I'm honestly surprised he didn't have sex with the Chihuahua. That's the only part of it that surprises me. Of this, it does story. not say he did not have sex with the. That's true. Chihuahua. That's the true. I am extrapolating. Under it was we don't under, know, you know pregnant with what we don't know what got that chihuahua was pregnant. He, that's right was he covering his tracks because <laughs> then he knows when the chihuahua delivers and it's this ungodly man dog hybrid that the jig's going to be up that's one thing i really do like about clickbait it lays so many pieces into the story that you cannot put together and if you don't mm -hmm. read the story you would like be able to go into so many different directions that it almost forces you to read the story to shut down the meaning avenues. I like, want to see the the Curb Your Enthusiasm-ish scenario that led this guy to, or a Seinfeldian scenario that led this guy to pretend to be a veterinarian, to operate on a chihuahua with no experience and can't not do it. Yeah. 
I don't maybe try to impress, try to impress a girl. Like I, you're like, well, I can't be a doctor. Cause then she's going to, you know what a veterinarian, cause the animals yeah. can't say that hurts or that's wrong. Or why are I you, can, if I kill a puppy, whatever, like it's, yeah, I can't do this on a woman. I can't be like, Hey, I can, everybody get back. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm here. I'm like Ronnie this, isn't, this, this isn't good for the United States Chihuahua mortality rate. I will say that that's definitely taken a hit. All right, so I'm going to give you pieces of the story, and we'll see how it cleans itself up. So he was not a registered ver veterinarian. So, okay, okay. we got that yep. kind of in the posing as. Always look up your vet, people. He was a registered pet groomer. That uh, That's not enough. That's Haircut's not enough. I don't go to a barber for a kidney transplant. Uh, this was a home visit. Like, this was a... Uh, he, 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 he came, came to, to the, the house. Home. Yes. Oh man, the groomer did. Yes, the groomer came to the house. It was a good looking corpse, I bet though. Like the chihuahua would, die, but I bet bow. it looked right. Oh, exactly. The bow. Yeah. Oh. Mm. yeah. She looked better than she did when she was alive. Open casket. Open casket. 600 bucks he charged for the procedure. Seems like it'd be steep. I don't know what the going rate is for. He was just going to help the chihuahua deliver? Or what was, does it say? It doesn't say like there are missing stories in the journalism. Like they have not sent yeah. their best. <laughs> Listen, we understand you're cover you're covering the shelling in Kiev, but we got a we got a chihuahua uh, that we need you to look into. And it turns out that she died. Um, sugar is the name of the dog. Sugar. Aww, yeah. So sugar died from an infection because he uh, sewed her up with string. So close. So close. So close. He almost got it right. That's the, that's the real tragedy is that he bluffed his way through it and nearly did it and then used string. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to see if the puppies do, made it. It doesn't say. I got to look that. Oh, no. A stillborn puppy. So the puppy didn't make it either. Well, depending on how far the the pro life laws are in in Florida, this guy might end up going to prison. I think because that that was a life, right? That's I mean, it's not a it's two puppies, it's not a baby pup, or it's two dogs. If it's you know, if it could bark at or if it could uh, had if it had paws at uh, six weeks, then I think you can definitely charge this guy <laughs> with. Uh, That's definitely a heartbeat state, right? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, the tail starts wagging at uh, conception, I think. So this is definitely a, a dog murderer. Osvaldo Sanchez. So if you hear, if you see that name mm -hmm. at your uh, vet's office, do not leave your chihuahua. Or maybe this is what happened. It was, it was supposed to be uh, a dog abortion and because they've made it illegal in florida she had to go black market with the groomer this guy doesn't know what he's doing and now a poor pregnant dog has lost its life because the lady dogs have lost their rights in florida once again it comes back to desantis and his yeah. police state look what you've mm -hmm. done like we should like post pictures of look what happened to sugar because yep. of your authoritarian tactics they have to drive their dogs to North Carolina to get the dog abortion. Uh, and that's, that I mean, be... and that, that's seven weeks, right? So you, you better know right away because seven, that's, it's the, you know, so the one, one week for a dog is seven weeks, right? So you got to get to North Carolina pretty early, I would imagine. Surely this is sketchable. Surely this has turned into a, like you can make a sketch about, the dog and like you like well we're gonna have to no you can't you can't yeah. save that dog it's that's definitely oh yeah that's a really good dark sketch or like a like a curb kind of plot or something like you don't want your dog to be pregnant because the dog can't handle it but then there's no dog abortion place in your state so they have to like and, yeah yeah and was it rape or incest right well exactly yeah they don't talk about the father at all in this story no no we don't yeah we don't know what happened to that chihuahua I like it. Let's lay that off on your sketch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last one here. Um, oh, we should have saved that one for the end. That one definitely should have. Yeah. yeah. 
But I love this story too. The blind side guy. Oh, I did hear about this. Yeah. That yeah, they completely mil- milked him out of all the money, cheated him out of all the money, never adopted him, just have a conserv- conservatorship and took all the money from the all the proceeds and have been living like this crazy lavish lifestyle. Horrible. I, I mean, I did think it was a little extreme where some people are like calling for Sandra Bullock to lose her Oscars. So like, well, that's a completely different really? issue. That's for a performance. I, I don't think, well, I mean, I think it's terrible, but I don't think that's Sandra's fault. I mean, that's. I hadn't heard that. That's pretty. Yeah, there were some. Well, and I don't know how how um, uh, how legit that is. But you know how the internet is. They just take one person or like three people say it. And now like, well, there are calls like, okay, but it's not the Hollywood foreign press or anyone that's calling her to do that. Like there's clearly a, a difference there. But I mean, I don't think anything about that movie has aged well. Yeah. And now with this, it's like, I'm just despicable. I mean, I haven't actually seen the movie. Uh but I've heard that it there aren't like any positive black characters in it. It's just like Everybody white savior. Yeah. yeah. And then they make him out to be like mentally defective or whatever. And then it's like, oh, okay. So, I mean, I, I feel like the only way that they can, they can redeem themselves is to make a new movie about this very thing. Blindside 2, right? Blindside 2. He becomes... <laughs> He becomes like the enforcer and yep. he goes back to get revenge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Takes Maybe them Terry Crews. One by one. Terry Crews plays him. Absolutely. Yeah. Blind and Blinder. Or what could you, what would be like the, the sequel, uh, the, the Blinder side? No. Um, I don't know. But that's, I don't that's know. Like definitely something there. Be his, his, uh, his big tagline at the end when he finally catches Sandra Bullock and he's going to dispatch her. He'd be like, yeah, didn't see it coming, did you? <laughs> <laughs> or like, that's his line at her funeral or something. And like, yeah, she didn't see it coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's really funny. Yeah, take out the blind side. That um, I, I just love those stories when they actually come back around and you, you get the uh, story behind the story behind the story. And it just mm-hmm. shifts the whole world. Like the whole the whole moral universe suddenly goes, you know, and these guys who have been heroes suddenly become these massive villains. It'd be like Aaron Brockovich. Turns out she put that chemicals in the water for 10 years. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of history like that where for a long time, school kids were taught that Columbus was this wonderful guy, you know, and then you're like, Oh no, he was, uh, he was awful. So, I mean, there's, there's I yeah, probably, but it's definitely. I, I bet most historical characters, like if we actually went in and could really detail transparency behind the scenes of how they lived their lives and who they were, like they mm-hmm. tried that with MLK, right? With the affairs. Yeah, yeah. You know, almost everybody has, again, the kind of character, you know, half dark, half light. But if you just tell the light, it opens it up to just, you can just pull one string and it just all tumbles. It's yeah. historically most famous people. Yeah, but then it also seems like, like with JFK too, they're like, well, he was a philanderer. And you're Ooh. like, I don't know if this is a bad light, you're Petrino, <laughs> where it's just almost right? like this James Bond thing of like meeting with Cruz Jeff and three-way in a closet. And you're like, well, is that both sides in it? I don't know. I mean, it still seems like you're kind of glamorizing. Well, that was my whole thing about Tiger Woods, right? If he had yeah, just yeah. not gotten married, he lives yeah. the best life ever for a, you know, a bro dude. And he's mm-hmm. spending his porn stars. He's a billionaire. He's world famous. Everybody loves him. Just don't get married. Why would you possibly get married? Yeah, I mean, if you watch the docu series, the HBO one, like you can definitely tell his dad like screwed him up, and he, yeah, I don't know, probably just for the 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 story itself, where if you are like this rich, successful man and you reach a certain age, then the gay rumors are gonna start. Like, what's unless you're Leonardo DiCaprio? I mean, I think you just have to lean in if you are gonna be the bachelor guy, then you just lean into it. Like he does, like George Clooney did up until he 
married the the one international lawyer or whatever for a while, but like, you know, just uh, be you, right? Just stop, like, you know, when yeah. you have trans people, like the bravery it takes to to do that publicly, then like, it's a very small step to be like, you know what? I don't, I don't think I'm cut out for monogamy. I doubt the world if Tiger Woods did that would be like, shame, shame on Tiger Woods. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It's like they, it's almost like they don't really think it through. No, probably not. You know, probably almost like not. they're living this crazy, you know, enjoyable life, and they're like, "This, this, this will just keep going. I'll just keep doing this." Well, and it, it's probably like um, like Bill Burr's bit about Arnold Schwarzenegger when he finally got caught with the the nanny or whatever, and people are like, "Well, how could he do?" And it's like this guy's been batting a thousand forever. Like he's got the most amazing life in the world. And so when, when, and I, I would imagine that Tiger was probably a philanderer long before he got caught. And I'm sure they, they might've had some sort of Clintonian agreement of like, well, just don't throw it in my face. But then as the years go on and he doesn't get caught and he's just chasing more of a high and more of a high that eventually you know, it, it's all out in the open. And then the wife has to be like, well, I'm going to look like this weak piece of shit if I, so now it's for sure done. Um, but yeah, who knows? All right. Well, we would be remiss if we get out of here without talking about the fourth, the Trump indictment. You know, the yep. devil, went, devil went down to Georgia and got caught by the tail. Mm -hmm. what do you, get? you got Trump stuff. You got a take on that? I do. Yeah, I, I, I have a bit on how he's uh, collecting indictments like Pokemon now. So first was Porny Sore. That's the Stormy Daniels one. Spy Zard at Mar-a-Lago. Rioty Poo. I don't have a good uh, Pokemon one for the Georgia one yet. but So I riff on that and then about how we should have a monument in the U.S. now devoted to our most corrupt presidents called Mount Hushmore. <laughs> and, and he would be up there with Harding and Nixon and Clinton. Harding? What did Harding do? Teapot Dome. He was, ah. he's a fun dive because he didn't really want to be president. And that's why he was like one of the most corrupt ones. Because basically all the industrialists were like, well, let's just put Harding in there and he'll do whatever we want. We can pick the cabinet and stuff. And he did. And he was, he was like gambling in office and he was corrupt as all get. And I'm pretty sure he died two years in. So the Teapot Dome thing was just leasing federal lands for oil drilling, essentially. Um, and that was when it got so overt that there began to be calls for reform. But he wound up dying um, like the third year in. And then I forget who took over afterwards, because I think that was like 1920. I think it was before Coolidge. Somewhere in there was uh, was in it. But he's a he's a fun character. He definitely. <laughs> You know, not exactly uh, Lincoln, this guy, but interesting nonetheless. Yeah, I thought the other day, like, um, I like doing the obscure things. Like, the thing about Napoleon that I like about it is that everybody has, like, seven mega touch points of information about Napoleon, like Waterloo and Joseph. Mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. But they don't, know, and, they, yeah. they don't know anything about, you know, him, really. Yeah. Which yeah. makes it a perfect thing to go back in underneath and start filling in details. Mm -hmm. And I thought about going after Millard Fillmore. Sure. Yeah. Like, just like I, I had this, you know, Jones for Millard Fillmore, and I just bring it up all the time. And, and like, why can't, how can you possibly not still be upset about Millard Fillmore? I mean, and just use that, that as my, use him as my sort of Trump straw man. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, that could definitely be like a fun sketch too. If you do like black and white White House correspondence dinner for Millard Fillmore, and then you, <laughs> and then you have everybody dressed like from that time frame, and you're just like the comic that was booked, and then just roasting him using references of the time and stuff. And yeah, that would be fun. Like, a, yeah, yeah, like I think historical presidents yeah that'd be like the now that, I, that is a great idea yeah like correspondence dinners throughout history yeah. for the presidents yeah that is a really good idea yeah i like that a lot that's fun good sketch break that yeah. one up i will i'm gonna jot that down now that's a good idea because yeah, you combine no, like no. drunken history with comedy central roasts and <laughs> sorry go ahead no i was gonna say like uh, miller fillmore 18 50 to 1853 so he only was three years did he die did he die during the 
That's the thing. You only ever remember the ones that were murdered, but a few of them died in office. No, he took over from Zachary Taylor, who died in office. Oh, okay. So, son of a bitch killed Zachary Taylor. <laughs> he wasn't even elected. It's true. And wasn't was reelected. So, apparently, people found out, you know, how rotten he really was. Did Taylor was was did he get reelected and then took over? Because was Taylor like one of those William Harrison guys? Like, did he was he only in office for like six months or a year? Uh, Zachary Taylor served the 12th president from 1849 until his death in 1850. Oh, so, yeah. well, there you go. I think he was from Louisville, where I'm from. Right. Isn't that Zach? Taylor? Yeah, he's from Louisville because they kept talking about exhuming his body. Uh you know, to prove that Miller Fillmore killed him. He was supposedly poisoned. Oh, really? you're not joking. That's a thing. Like they thought yeah. that's very Roman. That's really fun. I yeah, like that a right? lot. A that's, yeah, of... that's some House of Cards stuff. Right? Yeah. Like Trump's our closest to, well, I get, who'd be our closest to Caligula? Would that be JFK? Oh, like, man. It's all hidden, but... uh, well, sexually maybe JFK, but I don't, you'd probably have to go back to one of these 1800s guys that could have got away with being like a real psychopath and no one would have known i wonder if you did that like a um like a corrupt off or whatever like uh caligula versus pope innocent the third i think it was yeah third. yeah yeah you know like and you just like went down the list like you know how they do those battle royals like would a ninja beat a roman gladiator yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah or like if a bear fought a shark you know that kind of thing yeah, yeah. more degenerate Pope Innocent or Caligula. Yeah, yeah, that would definitely, I'd watch that show for sure. I don't know if any former president compares to Caligula, but it definitely, that is one thing too. I, you know, and it's like, what's the History Channel doing with the ice road truckers, with the, you know, making swords show? Like delve into some of these, we don't know anything about these guys. They could have been freaks and weirdos. Yeah, and there's all sorts of crazy stuff back there, like. No one, like, no one knows. Was like again, like you're talking about, like Napoleon getting slandered by the cartoonist. Apparently, yeah. that also happened to Caligula, right? Like, mm -hmm. like a lot of that stuff was just complete fiction that was used to slander him to get him, you know. Deposed. That'd be so in in real life. He's just like this Jimmy Carter, <laughs> like just a sweetheart, and he just makes like one 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 catty remark to a woman or something, and it's like, oh, he's having orgies and drinking blood and chopping off heads and. Now there's a good rhetorical project. Can you turn Carter, Jimmy Carter, into a villain? Man, yo, know, it's he's the he's gonna he's gonna beat hospice, this guy. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> the only guy to ever get out of hospice. Old, yeah, wow. exactly. He couldn't beat Reagan, but he'll beat hospice. He will come out stronger than he went in. <laughs> Uh, he wins every race eventually. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't get reelected, but um, re yeah, those guys. Life. Like I remember, like with Gandhi, the only slander I've ever heard on Gandhi was he slept with his thirteen-year-old niece, both of them naked, to test oh, like himself to test himself to see if he would have an erection because he believed he completely destroyed any type of of you know earthly desires i mean noble idea i guess the the, <laughs> the way he chose to carry it out i, I he's an empiricist very... that's yes. the point mm -hmm. he needs actual proof this this exact test uh was failed by jerry lee lewis i believe in the uh early 1950s yes and probably half the male population before that, the 1950s. Yes, that was to prove he could get an erection, I think. He was trying to prove the opposite, and boy, howdy, did he come out on top in that. It's Great really funny. Balls of fire. Yeah, it's funny, because like <laughs> Elvis, because Jerry Lee Lewis at the top of the world, and he's, he's like, hey, everybody, this is my, yeah, you know, goes out whether Mary, they do a little bit of reason, like, oh my God. And then Elvis, who was like all set to like, hey, this is Priscilla, was more like, ah, let's just keep her away from the limelight for at least three or four more years, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a whole different approach to pedophilia. These Absolutely. Guys. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, there you go. Like, uh, so what what is your prediction for Trump? 
I mean, I there's no way. Well, I guess if he gets a sympathetic juror on there, maybe he's not convicted in all of them. I assume he'll be convicted in at least a few statistically. Like he's got there, there, there's the E. Jean Carroll defamation thing. So it's really like five trials he'll be juggling. I think he gets the nomination for sure. I don't think anyone stops him there. I don't know. Do you think he'll wind up in prison? I don't see him going to prison. I can't see like he's a, you know, he's never been convicted of anything. Right. So he has no prison. Yeah. He has no record. Yeah. So first time offender doesn't seem like that's a prison sentence. I mean, but it is treason. If yeah. They, you know, if they push it correctly. I don't it's, as far as legally, I, I don't think it's likely he goes to prison. I think it's more than likely he gets convicted of a few of them. But then is it a fine? What is it? And he'll probably appeal and that'll go on. I'd like to think that the American people, especially with the whole year of him bouncing from trial to trial, and as long as Biden can keep it together for one more year, I think we'll get real. And then hopefully he just like peace outs after like a year or two and is like, OK, I'm, you know, I'm out. And yeah, I, I don't know what, you know, artificial organs they're going to put in him to keep him going, but he's not healthy. Right. Well, that's the other thing, too, is like you almost watch it and just like as a human being, you want to be like, this is not how you should spend your last, you know, you're a grandpa. You're like, why are you letting everybody rip on you for staying in the. But I guess part of it, I would imagine, is just he's wanted this job his whole life. He finally has it now. Uh, I mean, if he does die, you get to die president like they, we haven't had that since like FDR. Right. Like he'll go to bed president. Think and of the we'll boos. never know Think of, not being president. Like, you know, the Gandhi, the Gandhi funeral, there weren't people booing, right? Yeah. There was not a lot of booing at the Gandhi funeral. If Trump's funeral, it'll be at least <laughs> half boos. Yeah, I was about to say, when, when Biden does die, whenever, especially if it's in office, I think you're going to see like a complete, then it'll be like this elder statesman that, you know, helped Obama, helped the country. Like right now, it's like, oh, he's a piece of shit. He can't bring people to and then like the second he dies it'll be a complete 180 and the well he helped unite and help but yeah with trump's i mean it'll probably be it'll be a party for everybody the right's gonna be like woo, our boy celebration and then the left will be like thank god he's dead so i don't think there's gonna be any real mourning i think there's gonna be a celebration <laughs> of life on the right you know, like a viking funeral and then the left will be like you know dancing on yeah. the grave but I think that'll be the that'll be the common ground. It'll be the 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 left will get to dance on his grave, but it's got to be to like Kenny Chesney. <laughs> uh, who's the guy that has the in a small town? That guy that have to be to one of his songs. So the right likes it, too. But then everybody gets to dance. Have you heard the banjo guy song? The, the kind of MAGA banjo song that's out mm -hmm. right now? No. It's also getting a bunch of play because in the middle of it, he basically takes shots at people on welfare you know, obese people on welfare and, you know, like it's a kind of, you know, anti, it's this popular song, anti-rich man. It's called Rich Man North of Richmond, Richmond North of Richmond. So it's basically taking shots at the wealthy, good socialist, you know, that he is. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he just suddenly out of nowhere, just is like, and if you're eating, you know, 300 pounds and five, three, I don't be paying for your fudge rounds. And I'm like, Dude, that's everybody around you. I was about to say, about? that's, yeah, there are a lot of fat country music fans that are going to feel targeted by that. But the welfare, those are the fat ones that we got to villainize. So everybody just, just obesity, that's God's plan. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're, if we're paying for your, your cookies. Yeah, it's not God's plan that you're poor. But, or like, uh, you know, if he's against the rich thing. But like, it is, you know, you're, you're fat that's on you, but yeah yeah i saw a great meme about that it's like so you're you're going after the wealthy class right like a good socialist yeah you know, yeah and then you're mm -hmm. taking shots at the poor like a, a horrible capitalist like what make up your yeah. mind dude how, yeah how dare you not have money after these capitalist pigs take it <laughs> from us and you're you need help why would you need help i wonder if there's that genre out that uses all that kind of marxist language in a country music song I mean, yeah, you probably have to go back to like Woody Guthrie and like that's, I mean, unintentional, not intentional, unintentional kind of, yeah, early, early country. Yeah, and somebody said that they made a, a it's like, hey, draw, um, draw a line between this guy with his banjo and his Richmond song 
uh, all the way back to Woody Guthrie and, you know, people who are clearly singing for the values of the poverty class and the working class, not taking shots at people that are in the poverty class. So, but there's that sense of, um, they don't, they don't really understand the concept of socialism match up pretty, pretty well with a lot of the concepts of, you know, working class blue collarism. Yeah, there's probably, my guess is there's probably somebody in this guy's life that like bullied him and is fat and on welfare now, or his dad is like treated him like shit and is fat and on welfare. Like, I think to have a song like that and then just a complete like, what is this even doing in here is probably like, I'm going to stick it to Phil in this part of the song. Yeah, it's probably not social commentary, it's personal attack. Yeah, I think part of it is just like that. I think it, it maybe it, it's base or the inception of it. The idea was like sticking it to the elites, the power brokers, the wealthy. But then he also has like this one real fat, poor person he just can't stand and can't hit. He's willing to set aside principles to stick it to this one fat, but he can't sing it. It can't be like, you know, screw you, Pete. He can't say that because everybody's like, well, who's the Pete he's talking about? But like, yeah. Well, yeah. and I think like him earning it by by making sure this person was on welfare. Like as soon as he described that character, I'm like, well, that's my that was my Indiana Meemaw. Like, yeah, yeah. Five, three cookies. Like, but then it's like she didn't pay for those cookies herself. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, man. It was super fun. I appreciate you jumping yeah. on here. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Yeah, good stuff. Get out there. Where are you next? You just did Acme, uh, right? I was at Acme in Minneapolis last week, September, I believe it's 8th and 9th, whatever that second Friday, Saturday is, I'm doing the DC Comedy Loft with my buddy Steve. And then the end of September, I think it's like 29th and 30th, I'm doing the lounge at the end of the universe in Boise. Cool. So you yeah. feel like in, in Acme, that's got to feel like a comedy comfortable environment. You could just do whatever you want. Yeah. I, I I mean, I try to do it wherever I'm at and then I can adjust accordingly based on, I mean, I've done enough shows where, okay, they're a little hostile to that. I can pivot and stuff, but I mean, the way I'm framing it now, I think I get most people on board for, so <laughs> we'll see, but I try not, I try, cause some people are like, well, do you do like liberal jokes for conservative crowds and conservative? I'm like, I try to do that for the people that are in the audience that night. Like it's, it's going to be different people. And so it's, you know, I'm not going up there calling Trump the devil. You're all retards for loving him. Like, I'm, that's not what I'm doing. I'm taking issues and joking about that. Can you that. do that for me? Can you do one set where you just do full, <laughs> totally anti-Trump and just do it and we'll tape it and you'll yep. get some national attention I'll, from that. That'll be, that'll be my closing bit in the church. That'll be the, the dying for your sins special. Yeah, Trump on the cross, right next yeah, to yeah. Jesus. They're talking <laughs> to each other like, yeah, me too, you too, yeah. yeah. It was rigged, that election between you and, and uh, who is it? Uh, not not Brutus, was it Brutus? No, who is the, Barabbas. who is the, Barabbas, yeah, Barabbas, it was rigged. It was rigged, you you should have won that one. <laughs> awesome. All right, man, yeah. well, uh, everybody yeah. go out and see Robert Burrell, check out his website. Very funny guy, I appreciate it. We will uh, see you again on The Blast with Dr. Dan.